my name is Carrie Manning. I'm a professor of political science at Georgia State University in Atlanta. And thanks to Danielle and you and you wider for um, inviting me here to present. Um, I'm going to be talking about foreign aid and um, democracy in Mozambique as a country that at this point represents a dominant party regime. And I want to focus on a couple of things. First, with respect to what donors are doing in Mozambique now, there are two trends that are important that I want to highlight. One um, has to do with the impact of budget support. Um, and both, I'll talk about both the intended and the unintended consequences of general budget support. Um, most aid in Mozambique has shifted toward budget support away from project and sectoral support. And the second trend I want to highlight is the shift from, you know, we tend to talk about democracy aid as supporting democracy and governance, so, you know, D and G. Um, what we found in Mozambique uh, is a shift from support of democracy elements toward support of governance. Um, and I'll talk about the reasons and the implications for that and what I see as the difference between democracy support and governance support. So um, this research was based on field research that I conducted with my co-author, Monica Malbro, um, last June. And we had meetings with a number of aid donors as, as Gazebo, um, as Mamudu laid out, excuse me. So the bottom line, in case I drone on for too long and don't get to my bottom line in time, is that I think that um, budget support in Mozambique has tended to uh, support, to give strong support to the incumbent advantage. And I even would argue that even though the aim of general budget support has been to build the state and to strengthen state capacity, I wonder if the effect has not been more to strengthen uh, the particular regime in power rather than the state as such. Um, second, I would echo, I think Mozambique echoes what Danielle and Mahmoud said um, about donors being or at least feeling powerless when it comes to certain aspects of democratic deepening. And I think this realization, uh, the frustrations that donors are feeling with respect to their ability to impact government decisions when it comes to uh, things like electoral administration, and other decisions that central elites make is one of the driving forces behind the shift in donors' attention away from those democratic elements and toward supporting governance elements and shifting support also from a, an almost exclusive emphasis on central government institutions and toward um, a focus on local government institutions. It's not the only reason. There are good reasons, positive reasons also to support decentralization in a local government. But I think one of the things, what donors told us at least, was one of the things they were, they were one of the reasons behind this shift was their sense that they couldn't really, they had reached the limit of their ability to influence transparency and accountability in some respects at central levels of government. So let me give you a brief overview of um, Mozambique and some justification for why it can be characterized as a dominant party state. And then I'll get back into some of the details of what's happening with aid there. So as most of you probably know, Mozambique endured 16 years of internal conflict after um, independence in 1975, and then um, had an internationally supervised peace process that began in 1992 and culminated in uh, multi-party general elections in 1994. So those were the first multi-party elections um, in Mozambique. And since then, they've had four rounds of general elections. The last were in 2009. They've also had three rounds of municipal elections uh, in 98, 2003, and 2008. And really, there have been few major problems in Mozambique. It has been viewed very widely, and I think for the most part, um, uh, justifiably as a success story. There's been no return to conflict. There's been very little civil unrest. Um, the main opposition group, Renamo, made um, the transition to a political party, and at least in the first couple of elections, made general elections quite competitive. Um, and so we had a, a fairly robust two-party system um, emerging, at least in the first two or three general elections. I make, have made the argument that I think that is changing as the ruling party's electoral advantage and its, pow its hold over political um, and economic aspects of national life in Mozambique increase. Um, so over time, 
um, we have seen these two developments. We've seen this increasing entrenchment of uh, the ruling party, Frelimo, which has ruled Mozambique since independence. So from 75 until 94, um, it was an unelected uh, ruling party. And since 94, it has been the elected ruling party. And this, at the same time, we've seen a, a really insufficient development of the main opposition party. So Renamo surprised people when it came out in 1994 with such a strong showing in elections, and again in 1999. But since then, there's been very little internal organizational development of Renamo, um, and this is finally starting to, to affect its ability to, to garner votes um, at general elections and, and even local elections. That weakness in the opposition party is related to, but it's not entirely caused by, the increasing dominance of the ruling party. Okay, so Frelimo has, as I said, increasingly um, entrenched itself in terms of its electoral advantage. In 2009, the, Frelimo's presidential candidate won 75% of the votes in the presidential election, and the party had about the same share of seats in the legislature. So that's a tremendous um, advantage that pr pr uh, allows the ruling party to essentially do whatever it wants uh, to pass its legislative program in and also to change the Constitution. They only needed a two-thirds majority to change the Constitution. Uh, Frelimo also won all of the municipal elections in the last election with one exception in Beira, the second largest city. So the ruling party is able to dominate um, the rulemaking process and the implementation of these rules as it pertains to elections and as it pertains to most other things. And Frelimo has used this dominance to ensure that it doesn't have to trust its fate to the uncertainties of elections. Um, what I mean by that is uh, an example of, of what I mean can be found in the 2009 elections. So in 2007 and again in 2009, the National Assembly, which was already at that time uh, strongly dominated by Frelimo, passed new legislation to revise the electoral law that imposed very um, much higher requirements for candidates to get documentation um, in order to support their candidacy. And then uh, just before the 2009 elections, there was a new party that emerged, a third party that was a breakaway from Renamo that I think both Renamo and Frelimo saw as a, as a threat. That party was called MDM. That party was prevented in the end from running in um, all but four of Mozambique's um, 11 electoral constituencies. And um, this National Elections Commission said it was because documentation was inadequate, but they never provided, there was no transparency around that decision. Um, and so that, that process lost for Lima a lot of credibility in the eyes of donors. It precipitated the donor strike that Danielle um, referred to in which the major budget donors, most of them withheld support until the government addressed some transparency issues. And that election, though the decisions that the government made around those elections really demonstrated its ability to essentially control not just the rulemaking process, but how those were implemented. Even where you had a National Elections Commission that was supposed to be representatives of, of civil society and opposition parties, the government and the ruling party, um, the government was essentially able to handpick who those representatives were for civil society as well as for its party um, and the government. By the way, the donor strike did not last very long. The government uh, donors were insistent that the government address transparency issues not just relating to the election but also to relating, relating to the increasing blurring of the line between party and state. And the last, over the last two elections um, with President, President Gabuza has had an agenda of returning, reinserting the party back into the life of um, the state through a variety of mechanisms. And donors asked for um, more clarity on those issues and didn't really get it. So both ho horizontal accountability and vertical accountability mechanisms are weak. Um, you have, as I said, executive dominance over the legislature and you have single party a single party dominates essentially all institutions of government at all levels. Media independence is there. There's a thriving um, independent media um, sector in Maputo and in the major cities, but outside of the major cities um, with the broadcast media, there's not so much. Also, as you see in a lot of other African countries, there's a big divide 
between urban areas and rural areas in terms of the strength of civil society. So if you go to Maputo or Beira, you see very strong uh, civil society organizations, but when you travel out a, a bit, it gets a lot thinner. Um, and that's a challenge for donors who want to work with civil society organizations as well. Okay, donors in Mozambique. Um, donors have long played a pivotal role uh, in Mozambique. So they were very important in the war to peace transition. Uh, they were very important in the transition to multi-party politics. One of the innovative things that they did, that was fairly controversial at the time, was giving about $17 million to Renamo in the form of a trust fund to make the transition from rebel group to political party. They, but they did a lot more than that. They also built the confidence uh, built confidence on the government side, helped ease economic conditionality for the government in exchange for um, the transition process, and so were extremely involved. One of the reasons they were able to be so involved and to have the confidence of both sides is because bilateral donors uh, had been in Mozambique for quite a long time. You had this sort of uh, Nordic countries were there from independence onward, the US, IMF, World Bank, um, Western institutions began going there in the early 1980s with the drought and the humanitarian emergency that that created. So during that humanitarian emergency, a lot of these donors um, began to uh, build institutions that allowed them to coordinate um, their aid with one another. And that has continued through the support for Mozambique's transition and um, after the transition. So I think Mozambique has historically a, a pretty high degree of donor cooperation and coordination that kind of dates back to this collaboration on relief, even though there's a very large number of donors there. Um, and so it's a good thing, actually, that there is this history of coordination and cooperation. OK, the current focus of donors, as I said, is general budget support. It's, I think, governance over democracy, and within Within the rubric of budget support, there are a fairly large number, probably over a dozen working groups um, that are designed to bring donors and the government working in a certain area together to facilitate the sharing of information and reduce duplication and sort of promote strategic thinking. So let me say a little bit about budget support. Um, budget donors in Mozambique include most of the European bilateral donors, uh, the African Development Bank, the World Bank, and the European Commission um, does not officially include the United States. Um, in 2009, the United States and um, the UN became associate members of the Budget Donors Group, which is known as the G19. And they attend meetings and donor coordination groups, but don't commit ahead of time to the common G19 policy. Typical for the United States not to want to sort of commit to any kind of, um, pre-commit to any kind of group decisions. Um, and for these budget donors, the overwhelming majority of the aid that they provide to Mozambique comes in the form of budget support. And this is, this is sort of striking because, particularly with the Nordic countries, they have a very long history of project support. I mean, we all know that, that the shift in general terms has been, you know, for all kinds of aid, has been away from project support and, and toward budget support. And generally, that's viewed I think rightly as a, as a very good thing. But it's a striking transition for a lot of these donors who, who had followed a very different sort of pattern in Mozambique for, for years and years. So most of them now shifted to uh, budget support. Together, the G19 budget donors, so there are 19 of them, hence the name, um, pledged a total of $471 million just in 2009. And between 2004 and 2008, they spent $1.7 billion in Mozambique. Um, so I think the number of donors and the amounts of budget aid make this one of the biggest budget support programs um, in Africa. Now, how does this have, what are the implications of this for, for democracy? Um, budget aid is structured around the poverty reduction strategy paper, uh, which every country, most every country that receives significant aid has. And that paper, it's called PARPA in Mozambique, it sets out the parameters for government priorities during a five-year period. So now they're on their third, they're started on the third PARPA um, in Mozambique. And it has an explicit monitoring and assessment framework built in that's supposed to guide uh, budget support. Donors, like I said, participate in donor coordination groups that are meant to facilitate um, dialogue with donors, between donors and government, and between civil society groups, 
that are working in that particular area. In practice, usually it's donors and government representatives who participate in these, with a few exceptions. So the thing about PARPA is because it's an attempt to sort of focus government priorities and funding for those priorities over a five-year period, logically a lot gets excluded. So in, um, in Mozambique's case, the strategies that support budget support, monitoring, and assessment have all revolved around three pillars. And those are poverty, governance, and human capital. Things that don't fall under one of these three pillars um, don't get a lot of attention. And one of the things that doesn't fall under these pillars, two of the things are the National Assembly and civil society. Um, <clears throat> in Mozambique's um, framework, governance focuses even more specifically on public sector reform and um, what is known as justice, legality, and public order. And public sector reform includes support for local government. So there's been a sort of ongoing, uh, about decade-long, decentral, gradual rollout of decentralization in Mozambique. And so support for local government is naturally part of public sector reform. And in this context of the PARPA, justice, support for justice, legality, and public order primarily means a fight against corruption um, through the support of national monitoring mechanisms like the audit court. So these are the priorities in, in governance. Um, and donor working groups are formed around these priorities. So what are the implications of this? Um, one of them is that, I mean, one of the novelties or one of the positive innovations of um, general budget support is that there is joint monitoring and assessment built in between donors and government. So it's not just donors monitoring the government's um, activities, but it's a sort of annual assessment by the government of what donors have done and whether they've met their commitments. However, it has, the process has not been conducive to horizontal accountability within the state. So it almost promotes more accountability between donors and government than between government and any domestic constituency. And for example, in the PARPA, in the entire PARPA II document, there's not a single mention of the National Assembly uh, and its role in this process. So there's a paragraph on media, there's a paragraph about civil society, there's a paragraph about business organizations and workers' organizations and you know, local consultative councils and donors. Um, and, but there's literally no mention of the National Assembly. And there are two sentences that say the opposition should work to voice its support or constructive criticism of the PARPA but there's no mention of formal channels through which they might do that, which I, I think is a, an odd exclusion. Um, as I said, issue areas that aren't explicitly included in the PARPA have tended to be um, marginalized. And again, I mean, donors have to make choices about what they're going to, to support. And with coordination um, you know, comes a and sort of common goals. Naturally, certain areas um, will be marginalized. Um, and these, as I pointed out, have tended to be, in, in Mozambique, civil society and the National Assembly. Um, efforts are being made by DFID and other donors in the area of civil society development. So several donors support a common fund that gives support directly to civil society organizations. But generally, this is limited to the strongest. There is a sort of handful of very strong CSOs that are, that are doing very important work. Um, but most CSOs are not able to absorb the kind of support that um, donors would be able to give. Um, and finally, budget support uh, makes the government look good when really it is donors who are providing the goods. Now, I mean, to a certain extent, it's always been the case in Mozambique that donors are providing a lot of what is ostensibly provided by the government. So even now, about 49% of the budget is supported by donors. Um, that, that share has been larger in the past. But in the past, when you had project support, you had more visible markers of this support. So you know, things were given out, trucks were, you know, had emblems on the side, and, and people, people used to talk about, like in 1994, when I first did field work in, in Mozambique, I asked people in rural areas, what did you know, what are the problems that you have here? And they would say things like, well, the problem is the World Food Organization hasn't been here recently to make a, you know, 
to d deliver your world vision hasn't brought us food. They talked about things in terms of what NGOs were doing rather than what the, or not doing rather than what the government was doing. So even state, normal state tasks, people sort of attributed those to NGOs. Now, um, those activities are carried out by, uh, um, uh, by the state but still funded um, in large in, in important ways by donors. So I'm not saying we should go back to project support, but I am saying that there's a sort of subtle dynamic by which the degree to which the government is, is actually, the state is actually providing services that we all expect states to, to provide has not necessarily um, changed. It's still funded by donors, but people don't see it anymore. It looks now like the state is actually providing these goods. And that's why I said, I think that especially in, an, in a, an electoral regime, budget support may be strengthening the, the, the government of the day rather necessarily than strengthening um, the state. Okay, and finally on the shift of toward support of governance aspects rather than democracy. As I said, I think this is fueled in part by disenchantment on the part of donors with uh, decreasing transparency and traction in the political sphere, um, particularly at the national level. And so donors are shifting their focus to the local sphere and to governance over democracy. And what I mean by governance over democracy is, you know, donors still support elections. Um, they still support the National Assembly, but in very small um, amounts now or with respect to the National Assembly. The amounts are bigger with elections, but again, support for elections is episodic um, rather than sort of the electoral process being seen as something that is continual. Um, and again, the, the big money and most of the attention is on the PARPA, the five-year plan, and those elements don't fall under um, the five-year plan, support for civil society and support for the National Assembly. And I don't want to overstate the shift to local level. There's still support for governance at a central level. So at the central level, the G19 have made a commitment to improving transparency and accountability when it comes to the management of public funds. They fund the audit court. They, help, they uh, work with central level officials to provide um, uh, training on public sector management, um, public investment. And they have an integrated program. They're working with the government to develop an integrated program for budgeting and monitoring of budgeting from the central level all the way down to the district level. Um, but what's interesting is that as, as donors, even, even though there are these, there's still support at the central level, donors are now dividing up provinces and, and picking districts to support. And so even though we have, on the one hand, budget support sort of seems to be driving everything. On the other hand, there's this interesting return almost to the days when, of project support, when donors would sort of divvy up the country and say, okay, this is our, these are our five districts that we're supporting in this province or these two provinces. Um, which again, sort of requires um, donors to rethink um, coordination. Are they giving the same information and the same training to all of these uh, district level officials, for example. Okay, and finally, something that I think is, is a, a bright spot, an encouraging spot um, on the horizon in Mozambique is that with this emphasis on local um, support to local government institutions, um, donors are starting to integrate democracy aid and development aid. And they're doing this by focusing on servi essential service delivery um, as an entry point for governance work, which I think is, is very promising because one of the things that democracy donors have struggled with is how to make democracy relevant to people's everyday lives in between elections. And so at the local level, um, you now have governments that are responsible for providing water, sanitation, uh, health care, and so forth. And donors are uh, focusing on building community decision-making ability uh, on service delivery. So I think this is an area where state building um, and support for civil society can, can mesh and also where dem democracy and governance um, can intersect. Um, so let me stop there since I'm out of time. And thank you. <laughs>